And so I've prepared this to sort of show you that what's going on here is not something being done at a remote location someplace. You are right in the cutting edge of what's happening in various places in the world. And uh, now the issue I want to show you is that uh, this is my notes for the class, and I was going to write it on that blackboard, but nobody could see it. So that's my notes, but I was talking to my daughter on the phone about her pet turtle. And so the turtle is in this set of notes too, so you will not understand a lot of the stuff in this notes. Uh, Metalinguistics is one of Ben's specialties, and he's taught me an awful lot about it and why one would want to study it. And I want to show you today what metalinguistics is and that it actually has very, very strong basis in modern thinking about how the brain works and how computers work. Most of the people I'm going to mention to you were very concerned with what's the difference between a brain of a human, the brain of an animal, and a computer brain. Many of the, well, I'm not going to go into this, but many people think, aside from human beings, the most intelligent creature on Earth is an octopus, which is very strange if you think about it. Now, this is very interdisciplinary. I notice Ben has the word interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. And in particular, the people I'll talk about usually were not good writers and they didn't attract students to them that were good writers. But Chomsky is very different. He has the framework we are going to use, and he offered three definitions that totally changed the entire study. One is that a sentence is a string of elements from an alphabet. Now, if you believe that, then every language in the world is a language in this sense, because you could just type symbols on a typewriter. Some of the symbols you type will be very good sentences, and other ones won't. But in any, every language has sentences. Now, a language is a set of sentences. That is, if you speak a language, you can decide which sentences are in the language and which ones aren't. And that's what it is to be a native speaker. Now, a grammar defines a set of sentences. So if you believe this, then, can you raise the picture up a little bit? Okay. All right, so in a human head, that's supposed to be a human being there, there is a grammar. And that grammar defines the sentence from an, a bad sentence. So what it is to know a language is to be able to recognize a good sentence from a bad sentence much work on this. It does not have to do with meaning. It has to do with whether it's a good or a bad sentence. And typically the good sentences have, have meanings, but they don't always have to have meanings. Now, a compiler of a computer is the same thing. If you write a sentence in Lisp or Fortran, the computer can decide whether or not it's a good sentence or a bad sentence. And if it's a bad sentence, the program doesn't run. So exactly the same ideas that hold for human beings hold for computers and algorithms and things. Now, this is rather simple thing, just very simple definitions. And what most of my work consists of is recasting all of the work that has been done over the past 100 years or so into Chomsky's notations. There is no consistent notation for this type of thing, but there could be if one worked on Chomsky's definitions. Now, a fellow named Claude Shannon invented a thing called information theory. And information theory is not the normal word information. If I said, is there any information in the newspaper, you might say, well, yes, it's going to rain tomorrow. But that's not information in this sense. Information is a technical term. It only relates to the concept of a choice. You must have to make a choice. And the two main choices are yes and no. So I ask you a question, yes or no, and the information is what makes me decide that it's yes or no. Or there may be a choice of this one, that one, and that one, and the information is what makes me choose this one and not that one. 
There is a third concept of information that's a little hard to show you, but I'll show you as we go on. Now, one of the things about it is, or one way to look at it, is suppose you take a coin and flip it in the air, and it comes up heads or tails. So if you do that, then you could make a big string. You would say heads, heads, tails, tails, like I did here. Heads, tails, tails, heads, tails. Normally, in the notation of Stephen Wolfram, the heads is, he diagrams it graphically as a black dot and a white dot for tails. So the sentence is not the letters H-T-T-H or something. It's black dot, white dot, white dot, black dot, things like that. This makes for very attractive graphics on the page, but it has other implications. Now, suppose I did that, and I flipped the coin, and I had black dot, white dot, heads, tails, tails, heads, and then I just took one of those letters and erased it. And I ask you, which was the letter I erased? Was it a heads or was it a tails? You have to say 50-50, heads or tails. There is no information in any of the strings. There is no information anywhere that could tell you whether that's heads or tails. That is the definition of random. Random means there is no information anywhere to make any decisions at all. The concept of random number is one of the hardest concepts in the world to define. Alan Turing and his friends came up with some definitions. Uh, ben and I went to a, a big conference of Turing in New York City, and everybody had their own definition of random number. I would say one could become extraordinarily famous if you could figure out a definition of random that everybody in the world could agree with. There probably is one, but no one knows quite how to do it. All right. Now, suppose you now don't do it that way with just flipping a coin, but you flip a coin, and it comes up heads, which is a black dot, and then you roll a die. That is something that has six sides. So if you flip the coin and it's heads, and then you roll the die, and it comes up three, you put down three black dots. If it comes up one, you put down one black dot. So what happens is you flip the coin and get whether it's black dot or white dot. Then you roll the die to see how many black or white dots you put down. It's a funny kind of string. You will get lots of things that have six H's or six black dots or three black dots because you're going to get a lot of strings of the same color because on the die you can get one to six. Suppose you make a big long list of that. What would happen is you'd see big long lists of black dots and bl big long lists of white dots. This is a mathematical problem that I'm telling you what I think the answer is. Some people have kind of showed me that maybe this is not exactly true. However, I think it is true, so I'll tell you what I think is the truth. If you erase one of those dots, even though they're put there by a different rule, you still cannot tell me whether that dot was black or white. You can look at all the other dots on the page, but there's no way to tell if that dot was black or white. There's, if anyone is interested, talk to me and I can show you that there's, in some cases you might be able to. So, if you uh, think of that, now here's the interesting thing. Each datum, each dot is completely random. Each dot is completely random and you cannot say anything about every dot, each dot. However, suppose I do the following. Suppose I say, I have these strings where I did the die and the coin, and I have the ones where I just did the coin. This is where mathematics comes in, but there is no string you could get by just flipping a coin that you couldn't get by flipping the coin and the die. The die could always come up one. And there's no string you get here that couldn't occur by just flipping the coin. It just accidentally came up with 16 black dots. So there's nothing different about either of these languages. It's exactly the same sentences in each language. However, now suppose I don't say what was the color of the dot. Suppose I write down the entire language, all of the dots that come up, and I say, 
which language are we talking about? Was this set of strings generated by the coin or by the coin and the die? Instantly you can tell because you'll see big long strings of black dots and big long strings of white dots and that's almost certainly the coin with the die because that's what you're going to get. Now this is a rather profound question. How can you be so certain that it was the coin and the die and not just the coin given every datum is completely random? What you're tell I'm telling you is it's possible to make very strong deterministic decisions even if everything is totally random. Now, I don't know, we were talking to people with the stock market and the bond market. A lot of what happens in the stock and the bond market and the currency markets is completely irrelevant. It's just it, 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 random. It's random events. But there could be something about the way the data goes together that's not random even though it is the sum of totally random events. The sum of totally random events can be totally deterministic and not random. That's very puzzling to think about. So I mean, there's a lot of articles on this. All right, so in any event, what that shows you is random is a 50-50 chance. So if I erase any one thing, it's 50-50. But when you look at a whole set of them, it's not random. I could tell you right away whether it was the coin and the die or just the coin. And in fact, if Stephen was here, I showed him some of these things. Instead of just writing the sentences down like that, and in a square, if you rotated them, you would see immediately that, that which one it was, because it would look like the lines went up and down and not sideways. But in any event, let's get on here now. So in this, the coin and the flipping of the coin and the die is a grammar, and the sentences are these black and white dots. The sentences you generate are exactly the same. In other words, these are two identical languages. It has to do with the frequency of occurrence of the elements in them. Now that's why I said here there is a third thing you can talk about, and that is what is the probability over time of getting certain sequences and not other ones? If I were to ask you, what is, what is the number of heads and what is the number of tails in these two languages, it would turn out it was 50-50. There was exactly as many heads as there were tails. It's completely 50-50, but it's how they go together. It's the sequences, the syntactic patterns that makes a difference. Okay, so next page. Um. All right, so the question comes up is, what is information, and where is it, and how much do you have? Well, you can measure information, and where is it? That's a puzzling sort of thing, or a confusing kind of thing. It's actually in the language as a set of sentences. It's not in any sentence. It's not that this sentence shows you one thing or another, it's how the language goes together. <clears throat> now, we're getting now into metadata. Uh, so let's begin to think of this. Every, every datum is random, but the sentence data can choose between one grammar and the other. A um, little higher. All right, now, okay. Let's move to another example. Let's move to someone uh, like Claude, like a Turing. The last one was Claude Shannon with his information theory, which typically hinges on probability in general. Now we're getting into metadata and meta language. Suppose your alphabet is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and you have plus, minus, and equal. So what we're going to do is put these things, these symbols together and make sentences. A lot of them are just not going to make any sense, but you can get some that do make sense. So, so up a little bit, this one here now. Get it up about there. Whoop, okay. Suppose I say, I don't want an answer. I want you to tell me if this is uh, true. Is this sentence true right here? Well, there's two ways to solve it. One way is the brute force method. And the other way is Ben's meta-language way. 
The brute force way would be to add all these numbers down and see whether or not it comes up to 116. Okay, that's kind of hard. Suppose there's a second problem, up again to about here. All right, suppose there's a second problem, that is, I have one and the variables are plus or minus. Plus or minus here with 11, plus or minus 12, plus or minus whatever equals 12. Imagine if you have a big long list of numbers. Now the question is, which combination of pluses and minuses is going to make that true? And there might not be any. There might be no combination that can make it true. Now the, the issue about this is there is something we know about numbers. This is very typical of Alan Turing's thinking. Alan Turing was not interested in how numbers have a value, like three is bigger than two. He was interested in how do the numbers look on a page? How can you, what, why are they even numbers in the first place? There's a thing we know, and that is that an even number plus an even number has to be an even number. And an odd number plus an odd number has to be an even number. So an odd number plus an even number can be an odd number. So in order to have an odd number, we can add as much as we want, but we must have one odd number left over. If we don't have an odd number left over, the answer has to be odd. So we look at this up here, 1, 11 are odd, 23 is odd, 25 is odd, and 27 is odd. Well, this is going to give an even number, and that's going to give an even number, but this has nothing, so the answer cannot be even. The answer to that cannot be even. So without even adding and subtracting, we can say right away there isn't, this is, there's no selection of pluses and minuses that can make that true. So we don't have to go to the brute force technique. We can use meta-language. And knowing these different uh, combinations here, which tell you how the symbols go together, we can see that there is no solution there, and further, there would be no solution here if you had a wrong number of even and odd numbers. There is no combination. Notice you are not using the meaning of the numbers, and you are not calculating, you are computing. And one of Ben's main ideas is there's a world of difference between computing and calculating, and computing enables you to leapfrog over many problems, and not have to solve each of them and then try to evaluate them to see the best one. All right, the next page there. So, there are two ways to solve these kinds of problems. One is the brute force way which would be to add and subtract all these numbers or to take all the combinations of pluses and minuses and try to figure out which one is the right one. The other one is heuristic programming. These are names out of Alan Turing's work. It's rather you try to extract the patterns and you notice that you must have an even number of odd numbers to get an, e an, an even number. If you have an odd number of odd numbers, you're only going to get an odd number. It doesn't matter how many numbers there are, and it doesn't matter what their values are. It's just a property of the way you write down the, the, the system. So heuristics is the same as guessing. Many people use the word guessing. Uh, and meta-language is the level it it's on. And this is what hacking is. You're thinking outside of the box. You're not thinking in terms of normal calculations. You're thinking in terms of computations and what the overall thing is, the overall system is. There's many other words here that go along with this. I've only picked three or four people, but the paper we would work on would talk about all of them and relate their terms to all of them. Okay, put this up here now. Whoop, okay. Now, XLP, transdisciplinary, is not only transdisciplinary, it offers a system over all disciplines that's a meta-language that enables you to rate, relate things in this discipline to the other. And that's what we just did. Chomsky is a cognitive psychologist. Shannon is an information theory person. And Turing is a computer mathematician. But the notations I just showed you, sort of an XLP type thinking, enables you to develop one system that summarizes the whole thing 
and you can actually see how all of the material integrates, the integration and transdisciplinary. Uh, it's a transdisciplinary integration system. Now, Wolfram fits into this because he offers an incredible tool for doing all these things. If you want to actually try this, and you go crazy trying to write down all the black and white dots or trying to figure out how many coins can flip, rather you just program it into his thing, and then you can come up with very excellent graphics and begin to get a very good sense of what this whole thing looks like. So Wolfram provides a notation and a set of tools for doing all of this type of stuff. But the main conceptual things come from Chomsky, Shannon, and Turing. Um, okay, push this up a little So the question comes up is, what are you doing with XLP? Well, it's pretty clear this stuff is right out of MIT and Stanford and every place else. And uh, I work in Germany too, right out of all the latest labs. You are using the latest and the best theory and the most modern formulations of these computational and mathematical things there are. The uh, main Turing research today is done in England and in different places, but England's one of the headquarters. And this is very much of the type of thing people are doing there. What is the optimal notation for this? And I tried to show you there are ones. You have to integrate these various disciplines. So hacking is really heuristic programming, and it's a way of guessing. It's not that you go to the answer a little bit at a time and a little bit at a time. It's rather you guess, and you've got a good guess as to what the answer is. There's a method in statistics called Monte Carlo method. And the Monte Carlo method is very much like that. You try to guess the solution rather than arrive at it by deduction. So if you think of Ben's XLP, whoops, uh, I can't do that on mine. Mine doesn't go that high. I can only go up to the bottom. But in any event, Ben's XLP is really a sum of learning methods and a learning architecture. So the structure of this class is certainly not a conventional class. This is not a conventional type of thing. And the type of learning methods that he has with students working with each other, this bottom-up system of students coming up with their own projects and their own ideas, is a totally novel system. And I want you to understand and leave with one idea that what you are doing with hacking is, in fact, has a long tradition as heuristic programming and guessing and all of this kind of stuff. And that uh, this hacker space is really a kind of thing that could very well form the method and the architecture for a great deal of learning in the future. The nice thing about it is it takes people with very heterogeneous backgrounds that don't have the same training and enables them to come together and actually be productive. And one of the nicer things Ben and I were talking about, it may enables people, groups, to progress at their own rate and not leave anybody behind because there's so much interactivity and blogging. So, okay, I say thank you very much. I hope you understood it, but I don't know. Okay. Any questions? This is a very rare opportunity you get to talk to Ray. Even for me, it's a great honor to have him here. Any questions? So let, let me give you... No, I'll, I'll give you one answer. Yeah. Uh, yes. to, yeah. Oh, yeah. The last part. The, the what theory? Uh, the first theory? Uh, the previous theory. Uh, the the previous theory. Why is it related to learning? Yeah. Uh, oh, you mean? And the last part. Excellent. Oh, what is the connection between this theories and our learning process? This XLP Oh. Yeah, I mean, I don't really get the point. Oh, I see. Yeah, fine. Oh, it's because most courses that teach the kind of thing I'm talking about try to get to the answer by having you solve lots of problems. So just take one example. I'll talk to you later if you want. But the one example where if I said, here's a big long string of numbers, is that true or false? Well, one could sit down and actually do all the additions and subtractions and multiplications and divisions. Or if I said, what is the best way combination of pluses and minuses to go in there? Very traditional method would be to actually try, to try each one and enumerate them out. This is actually uh, done very often. But a better way is to move to what's called meta-language. And now there is no general theory of what meta-language is. There are in the cases I gave you here, but in other cases there's not. And so meta-language 
enables you to actually go sort of to the answer very quickly if you formulate things at that level of abstraction. See, one of the things about XLP is it formulates not a theory of teaching. I have been involved in so many places where they try to reorganize teaching strategies. This is not a reorganized teaching thing that you're in. This is a reorganized learning strategy. And this is not a teaching laboratory, which somebody like John Dewey or somebody would have, or Maria Montessori. This is a learning laboratory, and I've never actually seen one. I mean, it's a, it's a novel and original thing. So I picked some examples that would sort of give you an idea as to what a meta theory is. But just take what you've learned here and ask, what was the architecture of the plan here? I would bet none of you could really do that. And what was the overall strategy of getting the students to interact and move to the front? Probably it's, it's hard to figure out. Uh, there are excellent articles on this stuff. And one of the most, in, to me, one of the most interesting things I've ever read was the school I was at was MIT. And it was where they were inventing, when I was there, they were inventing radar and sonar. And no one even knew what they were or how they would work. And they were able to get people of completely different languages. Uh, couldn't talk to each other. And people that were mathematicians and logicians and everything else to work together to invent a radar and a sonar. Now, it was well known that these are quite mathematical problems in solid geometry. So therefore, everybody that, that worked on it was actually a, a geometrician. They might have spoken different languages. But how many problems in the world lend themselves to this type of learning environment? Ben and I were talking about it. Well, the one you're doing does that, but other ones don't do that. Sometimes you actually have to have an individual person. It wouldn't make any sense to have a class like this and try to teach you how to play the guitar because some people would be very good and other ones wouldn't be very good. And it's not at all clear that one person interacting with another one would do anybody any good. So is some classes or some things where people interacting, even if they can't understand each other, can do very well. They invented the radar and the sonar in the United States. And I, some of the professors that I had, I mean, you couldn't understand them at all, zero understanding. However, they could draw their materials on the board, and then you could sort of see what they were doing, and then you could go up and sort of correct it. See, that was a meta-language. These graphical kinds of things, or these, you know, mathematics is a meta-language. But there aren't very many subjects that lend themselves to that. And I was rather surprised when Ben said he's writing a constitution, because I would never have thought you could do it with that kind of a thing. See, there are some subjects, and think about this, there are some subjects that lend themselves to what you're doing, and other ones don't. And there's a much bigger thing, which you are too young to understand right now, but you will get there. That is, in, in academia, people say, that was my idea. That's not your idea. It's my idea. You you're taking that idea from me, and I don't think you should cite, do it without citing me. This happens all the time. But see, that's not what's going on here. You people are interacting. And if you say, who's the author of this idea? It might be six people. See, that's not the way it is very often. People say, that was my idea, and you stole it from me, and you shouldn't have done that, and uh, you should cite me and put me in a footnote. The way I get around that in my life is by referring everything I do to people that have been dead 100 years. So I did a lot of research on people that were around 100 years ago. And every time I come up with something new, I always say I copied it from him. And that way, nobody that's a contemporary can say that it's my idea. But there's a, a deck. Just try to think of what kinds of subject matter this kind of a thing could go to. And it's all, well, you, you, it, because you're writing in Chinese and you're writing specific problems. But suppose you were in a mathematical problem and you were trying to invent a way to link the Russian space station to the American space station. And some of you spoke French, some of you spoke German, and some of you spoke Chinese, and some of you spoke something else. You can still work together very well because the picture on your screen would be totally statable in terms of computer programs and graphics and things like that. Now, there places where there is a meta-language are rare, very rare. Now, there's a second thing, and Ben and I were talking about it. While it's the case in electrical engineering and Wolfram's type stuff, people are very sensitive. And they say, you stole that idea from me. I thought of it before you did. That does not happen in some areas. Particularly, it doesn't happen in music. And I think if somebody played a wonderful guitar song 
and some other guitarists came up and said, I would like to play that, they would be very happy. They would say, wow, you know. And if you look at Mozart, he played all sorts of things, and then everybody stole his tune and put it on a different instrument. See, that's the way things should be, but that's not what it is in science and things like that. The second thing, it's not only just taking somebody's idea, there is a famous cook it cook in the United States, a cooking show of this woman who was a fantastic cook, chef, just amazing, uh, Julia Child. And she put all of her stuff out hoping people would take her ideas and change it. So she would do something like a chicken recipe and then she would be thrilled if some Mexican person took it and made it a hot spicy chicken. She never had any spices anywhere. And so uh, somebody else would take it and show you could do it with not a chicken but a, a duck or something. She was delighted if you took her ideas and completely changed them and you didn't have to say, I got this idea from Julia Child. First everybody would know it because she was that, that amazing. Uh, but the idea of that, well, I'll give you another example which I was just talking to someone about. When, when I went through school, I was always an engineer. I was never anything else. But if I published an article, it always had three other people on it. I mean, in fact, Ben and me and someone else are going to write this up. It won't be just Ben. It won't be just me. Because nobody's that smart. Nobody has all the experience. But in some fields, particularly English literature, there is only one author on any article. Very rarely do you have somebody else, unless it's somebody that needs a translation. But there is very little joint research in any of the humanities. I don't know how it is here, but it's very rare. You don't see people like me and Ben publishing something on, I don't know, Shakespearean literature and what it all means. It wouldn't happen. He would write his and I would write mine. The idea of collaboration doesn't exist. The idea of borrowing ideas from other people exists, but it's heavily frowned upon. And when you get into people whose egos, I don't know what the word ego is, but whose egos are that big, what is the word ego in? Self-worth. Yeah. Pe yeah, people whose egos are that big always think they are the one that have all the ideas. That's me. Well, you took that from me and you must give me credit for it. The thing I will say about Noam Chomsky and the other people I mentioned is he, these people are like fountains for ideas. And if you, everybody know, you're all in the same class and Chomsky's talking and you take one of his ideas and write it up and publish it and you say, I should thank you, I should put you in. He says, oh no, I never said that. That's your idea. See, that's why he's so, one of the reasons he's so famous. Because Chomsky never said to anybody, oh, put me in, that's my idea. No, he said, oh, that's yours, go and do it. You, I'd never even heard of that idea in my life. Which is very funny because if you're in the class, you know that the student got the idea from him, but he never does that. See, that's what it is to be super famous and super brilliant because he has so many ideas of his own, he doesn't have to have anybody else's. And it's very sad to see, uh, there's a place called the Santa Fe Institute. And given you people are here, you would like the Santa Fe Institute. It's in, I don't know where it is, California or something. Arizona? No, no. It's in New Mexico. And one of the things I really like about it and I thought was just amazing and I sent students there is when students go there and publish a paper, very often you see the student's name as the one who publishes the paper and the professor they worked with is in a footnote down at the bottom. Ah, that's not what it is, not what it was. I don't know what it's like now. That's not what it was at MIT. At MIT, if you published a paper with anybody other than Chomsky in that group, the professor's name came first, you did all the work, and you might get a footnote in there somewhere. But see, that's a very different thing than this kind of here, where you, you can't say, well, that was his idea, because I watched you people working, and it's clear you're on the web, because you jump up and run and talk to somebody else and come back, and, and I, I would, it's like blog posting or something. But it, I would say if you tried to do a track record of where the ideas came from here, you couldn't do it. I don't know. It'd probably be very hard to do. But that's not the way it is. And, and when you work in some, my brother, who's a wonderful guy, I love my brother, but he became a, he was a very good scientist and then he became a manager and then a big manager and then a super manager. He put his name 
on every article of anybody that worked under him in the company. So he must have 4,000 articles written, but he never did anything with any of them. But he's got his name on all those articles. Now, it's not because people are going to say, wow, you know everything. It's rather because people say, you must have been a great manager to have that many students publish, or that many people publishing papers. You're not, move, you're not in that school. This is not what your world is going to be if you go with him. But it's, it's a very different world out there. And the idea of meta-language is very crucial because it's meta-language that enables you to share information from one discipline to another. And that's why I put Chomsky up first, because his definitions are what unify this whole thing. Claude Shannon wrote for this many people, and that's about how many people still read him. And Turing wrote for maybe that many people, and nobody reads him. Uh, Chomsky wrote for everybody. So he's got the universal language for describing everybody's problems. So that's why I started with him. So I mean, imagine if you wrote a paper on some scientific subject and really proved something. You could trisect an angle. Suppose you proved you could trisect an angle, and everybody's been wrong since Euclid. If you wrote it in Roman numerals, nobody would read it. You can't do that. OK. All right, I'll let you go. All right, thank you very much. And as you can see, I like to talk. <laughs>